I'm going to go ahead, if we can get our stuff, and um, I'm going to go ahead and start reading the scripture. Hosea chapter 8. Set the trumpet to your mouth. He shall come like an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Israel will cry to me, my God, we know you. Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue him. They set up kings, but not by me. They made princes, but I did not acknowledge them. From their silver and gold, they made idols for themselves, that they might be cut off. Your calf is rejected, O Samaria. My anger is aroused against them. How long until they attain to innocence? For from Israel is even this. A workman made it, and it is not God. But the calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. The stock has no bed. It shall never produce meal. If it should produce, aliens would swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up, and now they are among the Gentiles, like a vessel in which is no pleasure. For they have gone to Assyria, up to Assyria like a wild donkey alone by itself. Ephraim has hired lovers. Yes, although they have hired among the nations, now I will gather them, and they shall sorrow a little because of the burden of the kings of, king of princes. Because Ephraim has made many altars for sin, they have become for him altars for sinning. I have written for him the great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. For the sacrifices of my offerings, they sacrifice flesh and eat it. But the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. For Israel has forgotten his maker and has built temples. Judah has also has multiplied fortified cities, for I will send fire upon his cries, or cities, and they shall devour his palaces. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you that you are so explicit about what happens when we abandon you, who are so good, and we abandon your covenant and your word. And we seek after the things that we think that will satisfy us. Father, we pray that you would work on our heart tonight, that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would cleanse us of all unrighteousness, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would give us wisdom and insight and understanding into your word, that we might leave here changed women. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Here are some things you may or may not have heard regarding teachings. Tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Aristotle said that. <laughs> Studies have shown that people need to hear or see a message at least seven times before it sinks in. People who do studies said that. Dude, you have already said that three times. I got it the first time you said it. Move on already. Me. <laughs> I have said that. <laughs> That teaching changed my life. I went out a different person than when I came in. What did they say? I don't remember. <laughs> also me. <laughs> God said, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. God, in Hebrews 4:12. In Hosea chapter 8, God repeats what he's been saying throughout the book of Hosea and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all of the prophets. He's saying, I'm warning you, repent, judgment is coming. I'm telling you this to encourage you to keep listening, to keep your heart open and your mind open to the word of God because we're hearing it over and over and over again. Don't shut down thinking, I've heard this all before. Learn from examples of people who did not listen to the voice of God through his prophets. I mean, these prophets went on for hundreds of years saying the same thing. I'm warning you, repent. Judgment is coming. Allow the word of God to penetrate the thoughts and intents of your heart. And when a teacher repeats themselves, remember they're just being like the father. It's a godly thing when they tell you seven times <laughs> the same thing in one teaching. So in chapter 8, God tells them what he's going to tell them in verses 1 through 3. He gives them illustrations to make his point in verses 4 through 13. And he wraps it up with his verdict in chapter, or in, excuse me, verse 14. So in verses 1 through, um, verses 1 through 3, he starts with a warning. He says, set the trumpet to your mouth. Sound the alarm. The word here is shofar, a ram's horn. 
Think of Jericho. If you're new to the scriptures, the people of Jericho marched around, or the people, the children of Israel marched around Jericho seven times, blowing the trumpets, and the walls of Jericho fell down. So, but think of Jericho, but you're on the other end of the ram's horn. You're not following the priests and the priests blowing it, saying, warning, warning. Imagine they're on the other side now. God's telling them, warning, judgment is coming, destruction is coming, and they're on the other side of the, of the trumpet. The trumpet is a, a, a horn used to gather the people, to call the people to God, but it's also a war instrument, and Israel was on the wrong side of the horn. And judgment was coming, he says, it's like an eagle when the enemy comes. The word here is nesher, eagle or vulture, which is a powerful bird of prey. And it's the same word used in Isaiah 40, 31. And they shall mount up on wings like eagles. Some of our Bibles say vultures, but I'm sorry, they mount up on wings like, oh, like vultures, just doesn't have the same kick to it <laughs> as eagles. But when you think about eagles, you think I do. I, I had this vision of a powerful eagle and how they swoop down over the water and they just lift up with that fish and then they fly on. So I was looking at videos of eagles. Oh my goodness, not just fish. They are like into wild boar and goats and wolves and coyotes and monkeys. And the guy that was narrating the thing, he was like, and coyotes, <laughs> here comes this eagle. And they're fighting with coyotes and they're fighting with monkeys and monkeys are fighting back and they're just lifting up and just carrying them away. And sometimes they're fighting with them. And the Mongolian tribes, they train eagles to keep the coyotes and the wolves out of their flocks. And so they'll come down and they'll just attack it and then they'll kill it. It's crazy. And God is saying, like an eagle, the enemy is going to swoop down on you. And when you look at these eagles, they've got a don't mess with me look in their eye. And they really just don't care. There was one where they went down and they swooped upon this crow. And all the other crows were like, like fluttering around. And the narrator goes, you know, I don't think this is really wise of you. And the eagle just reaches over and grabs another crow and starts eating it too. It's, it's destruction. God's telling them they understand this. This isn't just some beautiful metaphor how an eagle is going to swoop down. It was destruction without any care to the children of Israel whatsoever. Assyria was going to swoop down on them and destroy them. Oh, sorry, I'm still old fashioned. I saw paper. Deuteronomy 28, 49 says, The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as an eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you do not understand. This was in Deuteronomy. And Egypt swooped down and took the children of Israel captive, and they were there for 400 years. But they just kept, they never learned. And so when you get to the end of Kings, you'll find that... Um, Judah is swooped down by Babylon, and the ba they're taken over into Babylonian captivity, and you've got Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar, and then you've got Assyria swoops down on Judah and takes them captive. So they're split, and they're taken captive by these two different nations. And the reason that this has happened is because they transgressed against God's covenant, and they rebelled against his law. Willful disobedience. They knew the truth. They knew the correct way. They knew God. They just didn't listen to him anymore. He, they didn't listen to his instruction as he, as he instructed his chosen people. They were like, I don't want to hear it. I've heard it. And maybe that's, you know, you think, okay, maybe he said it too many times. Because once you've told somebody something so many times, they don't listen anymore. But he's a merciful God. He's a compassionate God. He's a gracious God. And he just kept giving them opportunities to repent. And they just wouldn't. In reply, Israel says, we know you. Help us. You are our God. But they didn't want to change their ways. They wanted to acknowledge they wanted him to acknowledge that they knew him. We know you. Like, you can get us in the door because we know you. But I don't want to change what I'm doing. I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to be obedient to you. I, I think you've just come too far into my life. So I'm going to do what I want to do, but I want you to save me from you. We know you, they said. Titus 1.16 says they profess to know God, but in works they deny him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. 
Everything they did was totally in opposite to what they said, to what they knew to be true. And the verdict then is that Israel had rejected the good and the enemy would pursue them. What is the good? God is good and God does good for our good and for his glory. God is all the time, God is good and God is good all the time. In Exodus 34, 6, it says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth. First Chronicles 16, 34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. In Mark 10, 18, it says, But no one, no one is good but one, and that is God. They rejected the good. They rejected God. They rejected his commandments, his covenant, his words. They rejected him outright. They'd rejected all that was good in God himself. And so the enemy is going to descend like an eagle on the, pe on the people of the Lord, which again refers to Assyria. And that comes in 2 Kings 15, 28 and 29, that Assyria is going to take the people into captivity. The people would call to God, but stubbornly refused to give up their idols. They had stubbornly refused to repent. Israel wanted God to stop the judgment without ever changing their behavior. And God wanted to, or Israel wanted to avoid the painful consequences of sin. It is never too late for repentance. When you, one of the great um, points of the book of Jonah is that there are a lot of good points to the book of Jonah. But one of them is, is it's never too late for repentance. When Jonah enters into Nineveh and he says, repent because God's going to destroy you. And the people of Nineveh said, oh, okay. And they put on sackcloth and ashes and they repented of their sin, which means they stopped doing what they were doing and they went a different direction. They went towards the direction of the Lord. And that made Jonah mad. He was like, all this evil that they did and you forgave them? Yes, because God is always waiting for us to repent. He is always waiting for his, the nation of Israel to repent. He's gracious and merciful. It is never too late. You can never say, I've gone too far. I'm in too deep. I've been, God's not going to hear me anymore. He will always hear the prayer of repentance. Always he will hear your prayer of repentance and that was what he was waiting for with Israel and then in verses 4 through 13 he makes a pronouncement and he gives some illustrations of what it is that it's almost like a court trial like he's he's made his opening case and now he's going to present all the evidence against them they set up kings but not by God he's not saying I didn't know these kings he's saying that I did not choose these kings I've always thought it was really interesting that when God chooses Saul, you hear the story of God talking to Samuel and Samuel going to Saul and how it all came about and then how he chose David, which we're learning on Sunday mornings, the whole story of how he chose David. And while it took a while for David to actually become king, God was with him, teaching him throughout the whole thing. And then there's Solomon, David's son, and how he became king. And then after that, you just get, and this person was king, and he died, and, and he did evil, and he died. And this person was king, and he did evil, and his son killed him, and he died. And this person was king, and you think, what happened? Well, that's when they started choosing their own kings. That's when they stopped going to God and saying, who do you want to be king, and letting God choose them. I always thought it was just because maybe Samuel died, and so God chose a different way. No, it was because they quit asking God. They just started setting up. That was where the division comes in in 1 Kings 12, that they go two separate ways. You have this long list of kings. And of 44 kings, only nine of them were considered not evil kings. You have good king Hezekiah, and um, in the days that Uzziah died um, was Isaiah. There's a few, but most of them were really evil men because they made their own choices. They chose people that they wanted, that they thought would do them some good, not ever seeking God and asking for his counsel on who they, he wanted for king. They also made idols for themselves out of their silver. They brought about their own destruction, and God's fury burned against them for setting up these idols, making idols with gold and silver. It's just crazy the mentality that thinks, I can take something uh, that I possess, gold and silver, and I can turn it into something else and then worship it as if it's God. 
When you look at it that way, you think, that is crazy. But I'm telling you, it's easy for us to do. We can put money into our houses and worship our house. We can put money into cars. Mostly men do that, but into our cars and worship the car. I looked at my yarn the other day and I thought, ooh, do I worship my yarn? <laughs> because it's something that you take and you put money into and then you start thinking it has some control in your life or it has some way of determining who you are as a person or how people will perceive you. And you start worshiping the image and, and the made thing instead of the maker and God. Verse 5 says, O Samaria, I reject this calf, this idol you have made. My fury burns against you. How long will you be incapable of innocence? This calf you worship, O Israel, was crafted by your own hands. It's not God. Therefore, it must be smashed into piece, into bits. You would think they would have learned from the golden calf in Exodus 32. Remember Moses went into Mount Sinai and then he hears this, this noise and he thinks something's happening. He goes down and the people had made a calf. And Aaron's like, I don't know. They gave me some gold. I threw it in a pot. And it became a calf. And the next thing you know, they're worshiping it. I don't know how that happened. It's like total denial that he had any part of it. So what does Moses do? He grinds it up into a powder and he spreads it across the water and he makes them drink it. You would think that they would learn. But they, it is in our nature to take possessions and turn them into idols. And that is what the children of Israel had done. It was their sin nature that worshipped something that they made with their own hands. He goes on and he says, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. I always thought this was they sowed to the wind. Like, you know, they just took their seed and it went out in the wind and wherever it landed, it landed. No, no, no. They sowed wind. There's nothing to wind. But the, the consequences of wind, of harsh wind, is destruction. And that's what they were going to sow for their sowing of nothing. Their making of their idols was nothing. Their going to Assyria and trying to make friends with other nations was nothing. Their making their, their secure places, their palaces and their citadels, it's nothing. It, it, it comprises nothing because they have no relationship with God, with the maker. All of their possessions got them nowhere. It is an interesting triple explanation here. They planted the wind and they'll harvest the whirlwind. And the stalks of wheat will wither, producing no grain. And even if there is grain, foreigners will eat it. God makes sure they understand your nothing is going to produce nothing. And if you think your nothing produces something, even that is going to be destroyed. It's just a triple negative. Nothing. They were, their works were nothing in God's estimation. I'm not sure this scripture applies right here, but this is what comes to mind when I think of this scripture. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says in the Amplified, let your character or moral disposition be free from love of money, including greed, avarice, lust, and craving for earthly possessions, and be satisfied with your present circumstances with what you have. For God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give up on you, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless or forsake you, nor let you down, nor relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. There is not a wordsmith like God. Jane Austen, great author. Taylor Swift, great lyrics. But God, his words are just perfect and the perfect word chosen for the perfect moment and he is telling you over and over and over again I will never leave you I will never forsake you all these things that people do to make idols they're nothing they're destruction and even if something comes from it it's nothing too but I will never no never no not ever leave you or forsake you He's telling you, don't be covetous of things, don't rely on things, that he is enough and he will never leave us. He tells them that they are useless vessels. The people of Israel have been swallowed up. They lie among the nations like an old pot that no one wants because it no longer has any value, even to be used for the purpose it was created. 
They're just lying around in the nations. There are nations that are prospering. Israel looks like it's prospered. It's, it has its palaces and its citadels, and they're wooing people. But they're just like an old pot that nobody wants. A pot at a garage sale or a pot out in the middle of the desert. Isn't it disturbing when you drive out in the middle of the desert and there's people's mattresses and their chairs and their pots and their pants? That was what Israel was like. Useless, wanted for nothing, nobody wanted them. And for the very purpose that they were created, they're not being used for that purpose. He said, you're like a wild donkey looking for a mate, hiring lovers, looking for a mate. They have gone up to Assyria, to the people Israel sold themselves to many lovers, just trying to get someone to attach to, to be a part of them, to make themselves feel like they were somebody because they had abandoned God who really thought of them as somebody. He said, you've multiplied altars for sin, which have become altars for sinning. The altars that were supposed to remove sin were actually increasing the sin through their misuse and the worshiping of Baal. So they created altars to worship God, to supposedly come before them to be forgiven of their sins. But while they're there, they're sinning because they're worshiping the wrong God. God had given them explicit instructions and offerings and sacrifices in Leviticus. I don't know, like, I know I refer to this a lot, but if you're doing the, the way you, the one-year Bible, and you went through Leviticus, and you're reading about all the sacrifices and all the ways they're supposed to be done, and who, who's supposed to do it, and how they're supposed to do it, and where they're supposed to be do it. God is serious about these sacrifices. He's serious about altars. He's serious about worship, and they're taking it and turning it into something that actually causes them to sin. It's having the exact opposite effect of what God had intended it to do. But God hadn't changed. The requirements were the same. Back in um, Leviticus, Aaron's sons had it wrong, and they died before the Lord. He, they had told him, he had told them to do something. They did something different, whether their intent was to do it differently or they just weren't paying attention. And God smote them, and they died. This was serious stuff. It's because everything that God asked them to do had an eternal purpose. Everything he asked them to do was leading them to Jesus. The whole point of the law was to show them, you can't live by this. The cost is too great. You're, you're sacrificing an innocent animal so that you can be cleansed by its blood, but it's just temporary because you turn around and you sin again. But every little detail leads you to Jesus. So when you mess with that and you start doing something different, it messes with God's eternal plan, and that makes him unhappy. God is a holy God. He's a pure God. He's, he demands... His purity demands a sacrifice, and he lays it all out, and they disregarded it, which disregards the whole plan that God had set up for them. As the people are making their own sacrifices and eating them was not one of God's directives. Only the priests could eat the sacrificed food. So they're saying, okay, I'm coming here. I made my altar. I'm going to worship on it, and I'm going to eat the produce from it too. It, again, a triple negative here. Setting up an altar God never intended, worshiping it was causing them to sin, and then they're eating the meat from it. They're just tripling again to their own destruction, and God took it very seriously. The altars of sin had caused them to sin. They considered God's word a strange thing. God says, I wrote for him 10,000 things of my law, but they are counted as a strange thing, as if something which does not concern him. Though the laws were written for them, the people of Israel acted as if the laws didn't apply to them. They weren't familiar with it. It had become strange, something that they just thought, you know, God said this, but we're not going to pay attention. We're going to do this over here because that's kind of strange. The thing that had been most precious to them was now strange and distant and not something that concerned them. God had spoken to them. He had given them commandments. He had communicated them with them. He wanted to be a part of their life. He had set up a plan and a path so that they could make a straight way. And they disregarded it and said, I, you know, it doesn't really apply to me. I don't really want to change. I really don't want your destruction. And I want you to know that I know you, but I really think your word is kind of strange. That's what they're saying to him. The sacrificial gifts that they eat, the Lord did not accept. 
And again, he made some pretty detailed explanations of gifts and sacrifices. And then in verses 13 B and 14, God gives the verdict. He says, now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. For Israel have forgotten his maker and has built temples. Judah has multiplied fortified cities, and I will send fire upon his cities, and it shall devour his palaces. Israel had built palaces and temples and fortified cities. But God says, I'm going to send fire down on your cities, and I'm going to devour your palaces. The New Living Translation says, Israel has built built great palaces, and Judah has fortified cities, but they have both forgotten their maker. Therefore, I will send down fire on their palaces and burn their fortresses. Israel had placed its confidence in military strength, in strong defenses and economic stabilities, and they had their strongholds, and they thought that it was enough for them to do this for themselves. But because of their moral inner decay, their apparent resources of strength were going to be inadequate against God, who was their maker. A nation that forgets its maker, its strengths may prove to be worthless when put to the test, which is a little concerning in this day and and age. The more that the United States puts God away and says we can't have prayer in our schools and we can murder babies and we can um, say that things are that are not, the more that we do that, we can't be surprised when God does not come to our defense and that when the world comes to destruction, that our nation is part of that destruction, not we as Christians, but the nation of itself. We can know there was a baby boomer era era where the United States was everything. We were a powerful nation and we could stand under that banner and know and think that we were protected. But it's almost a good thing to understand that that the United States is not our protector. God is our protector and our hope and our strength should be found in him. It's not in that they built these things that God was offended. It's that they forgot God in the process. They put their trust in things and they left God out of their plans. And so they sowed the wind and they were going to reap a whirlwind. In Psalm 78, 34, it says, when he slew them, then they sought earnestly for God. Then they remembered that God was their rock and their most high redeemer. When destruction comes, eventually they will turn to God because sometimes it is the um, discipline of our um, sin that brings us back to the Lord and helps us to understand all that he is for us. So I just want to point out some things um, kind of in a conclusion. One is that they set up kings, but not by God. They made idols. 1 Timothy 6.15 says, For at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and almighty God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Ephesians 3.17 says, Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. We need to be a remember that what they did was they set up their own kings. And we need to remember that Jesus is the king of our heart. And that Jesus is at home in our hearts. And it's him that we worship and in him alone. And we need to keep our eyes set on him and know that um, we have made that commitment. What do we do to keep from being like the children of Israel? We make Jesus the king of our lives. We worship him in our hearts. They sowed the wind and they reaped the whirlwind. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us do not grow weary while doing good. For in due time, and in, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, if we have an opportunity, let us to do good to all, especially those who are in the household of faith. So it's up to us to sow to good things, to not sow the wind, but to sow to everlasting life, to sow into people's lives, to sow into our children's lives, to sow anywhere that we have an opportunity to do good, then we're sowing to God's kingdom. I know that when we get to heaven, the Bible says that there will be jewels for our crown and that we'll be able to cast them at the Lord's feet. And I think that some of these jewels will understand um, how they came about. 
But I think a lot of it are things that we didn't even know that we did. That just as a Christian, just by loving your neighbor, by loving the person in line, by helping a person up, that these are the things that blesses God's heart. He wants us to be obedient, and we're called to be obedient. And I think God is blessed by our obedience. But I think he's just a little blessed more <laughs> when we do things and we act like Jesus without thinking. When Jesus is working through us and he shows us something to do and we do it and it's out of love and out of kindness and that we glorify the Lord because we're being like the Lord. We want to sow to eternity, sow to the spirit, sow to things that will produce eternal fruit. They were useless pots that lie among the nations. And 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of his power may be of God and not of us. We are vessels for honor to be used by the Lord. There was a song, and my kids can't remember it, but there used to be this song in the 90s about um, unseen treasure in a plastic box. They were trying to put that whole metaphor into something that we can understand because we don't use a lot of clay pots anymore. Just an ordinary vessel that we use every day when you think of plastic boxes. We do our meal prep, we put our leftovers, we seal things and we use plastic boxes all the time, unless of course you're better than I am about the eco ecology and you use glass. I just haven't got there yet, I'm still using plastic. But everyday utensils, we are not useless, we're not cast aside, we're not out in the middle of the desert, we're part of life and God is using us, but we're just simple vessels that his love flows through and blesses the hearts of other people and blesses God. The New Living Translation says the same scripture. We now have this light shining in our hearts. We, we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure that makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from us. He is light within us. He is the one that occupies us, and it's his spirit that shines out and that people see Jesus. 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 21, but in a great house there is not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anybody cleanses himself from the latter, he will be as vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. When we come before him, we confess our sins, we're forgiven, we're cleansed, we're filled with his Holy Spirit. We are vessels of honor that God can use in our lives. He says that they were wild donkeys looking for a mate. Okay, I was going to pass this one over, but I really felt like the Lord didn't want me to pass it over. I'm not saying, please, I'm not saying any single woman here is a wild donkey looking for a mate. I'm not. <laughs> I was a single woman till I was 30. I understand how lonely it can be being single. It, it can be painfully lonely being single. But those of you who are married also know it can be painfully lonely being married, even to the best guy in the whole world, because Jesus wants us to seek him. It's important that we understand he is most important. And I'm not saying that when you finally get this, then he delivers you a man, and so therefore this woman that got married got it earlier than you. He works differently in everybody's life. He does. But the sameness is that he wants to be Lord of your life king of your life, the center of your heart. He wants you to desire him more than anything else. The scriptures that ministered to me when I was, sing was single was Matthew 6, 33. Six, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I wanted to become a woman of God. That was my goal and my mission was to become a woman of God. And, the, and when he answers the prayer for a husband, that's his decision. But you can know that you can trust the Lord, that if you're seeking him first, everything you need, he's going to give you. Everything that is best for you, he withholds no good thing from those that he loves. Psalm 37, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who um, brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease for anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes causes harm. I like this song because it tells you what to do. It gives you instruction. 
You just don't hang around. You're just trusting in the Lord. You're doing good. You're dwelling in the land. You're feeding on his faithfulness. You're delighting yourself in him. It gives you things to do while you're waiting for him. The Lord, not the man. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple altars for sin. What, which, which altars become, which altars, I, I, didn't, I didn't write this right. Multiple altars for sin, which become altars for sinning. Be careful of your rituals in worship and why you do them. Not that you shouldn't do them, but why you do them. Be careful that your motive is a relationship with Jesus. Your church attendance, your daily devotions, your prayer. Remember, God's desire is a relationship, not a ritual. And I can't tell you, I can't. I can't tell you the things that are idols in your life. I can't tell you the things that are sin. I can tell you that a house is neither here nor there, but you can make it an item of worship. I can tell you that going to church is a really good thing to do. It is a discipline of Christianity that is so helpful, so needed, the accountability, the hearing the word, the being around other believers. But I can't tell you your motive of why you go to church. I can just tell you that God's desire is for you to come to fellowship with other believers, to hear his word, to worship him. It's between you and the Lord what items in your life that you have turned into idols or altars of worship. Psalm 30, 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the way, the path of everlasting life. Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you are sowing to the wind, if you become a useless vessel, if you're sinning at the altar intended for worship, <coughs> I can't tell you whether you're doing these things. Only God knows your heart, the intent of your heart, and the motivation of your heart. What may be perfectly okay for one person may be sin for another person. Activities, again, houses, possessions, internet presence, um, jobs. Only God can tell you whether these things are something that you've begun to worship before you worship him. All things that are material things are not sin. It's what we do with them. But I do know this one thing. I can't tell you what are idols. I can't tell you what are all sorts of worship. I can't tell you what you've turned it into. I know this one true thing. I know a lot of true things in God's word. But this one specifically in this passage, one of the most telling and grievous statements that God makes is in verse 12. And it's, he says, I have written for him great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. They considered God's word a strange thing. That when we get so distant from God's word that we think it's a strange thing, then we need to examine what we're doing, how we're doing it, and for what purpose that we're doing it. One of the things about being in fellowship is it keeps us in God's word, hearing the whole counsel of word. Have you ever heard someone say, and God's word says this, and you think, well, that's really strange. Why would God say that? And they're like, it's this scripture and this verse. So you go there and you find out God said all oh, this whole thing. And they picked this one little verse out and said, this is strange. Doesn't everybody think this is really strange? You should take your children out and you should stone them. Don't you think that's strange? <laughs> well, you know, if you're not in the full counsel of God, there's a lot of things in God's word. You can prove anything in God's word. You can pull out scriptures all over the place. And you can make a whole, and people do, cults out of them, all sorts of strange things. We need to be in the full counsel of God, which is what you're doing here. See? Good step. Good choice. Being here. So that when you're in God's word, it's not a strange thing. There's a confirmation of the spirit that says this connects to this, connects to this, and this is the full counsel of God's word. 
2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Amplified says it, Study and be eager, and do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, tested by trial. A workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing, accurately dividing, rightly handling, skillfully teaching the word of truth. That we are in God's word. We are protected in God's word. And God's spirit, it has a better um, connection with you, us to convict us of the things when we step outside of God's word. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119.105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. They had forgotten all the sweet things that God had said to them and considered them strange. But when we're in his word, then he leads us, he guides us, and it's hidden, and we again become more like him. When we cease to relate to God in his word, we are lost. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word is God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. When Jesus becomes a strange thing to us, we need to examine our lives, our altars of worship. We need to ask him to shine his light into our lives and reveal his truth, to give us a heart of repentance and set our feet on the right course. They, sac they ate their sacrificial gifts, and the Lord did not accept them. There is only one sacrificial gift that God will receive on your behalf, and that is the gift from God himself on, as the sacrifice of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. God has provided himself for a sacrifice. That's the only sacrifice that will do us any good is the sacrifice of Jesus, and we need to cling to that as the ultimate sacrifice. The only way to God is through Jesus, his perfect life in exchange for my sinful life. He is a propitiation for my sin, which means God's holiness demands a sacrifice, and Jesus is that propitiation, the fulfillment of that demand. The only atonement that will satisfy God's holiness demands a right relationship with him, and again, only through Jesus Christ. The way to obtain God's approval is through Jesus, his righteousness in exchange for my sinful nature. The only way to remove what I deserve is Jesus. The only difference between me and the children of Israel is that they did not respect God's covenant nor obey his laws. And the only way that I am able to do that is through Jesus Christ, who enables us to live the life that God has called us to live. Through his spirit, we're given power, but through Jesus' word, we're given the path and the light that we need to follow him. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that you are our all in all, that we don't have to read these words and think, oh, no. What about me and where do I fall in this? Jesus, we fall on you. We fall at the foot of your cross. We ask you, Jesus, that um, that you were to, I don't even have anything to ask you for, Lord. I'm just thankful. I'm thankful that you are my all in all. I'm thankful you are king of my life. I thank you that you sit on the throne of my heart. I thank you that I know that when I worship you at the altar of your word, that only good things, good seeds are sown and that you are glorified. Father, as we go to group now, we pray that you would bless everything we say and everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen.